Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 131st video cast and 121st podcast for the week ending April 21st, 2022. It's good to be back in Connecticut, New York, etc. Uh, we spent uh, we got back on Sunday, so a few days since we last spoke. Uh, this was in downtown St. Petersburg. So the first meet was in Tampa, then St. Petersburg. We went to this restaurant called Teak. They have this, and my wife doesn't always dress like this. She's actually a, a serious official in the swim world. Uh, so they give her all this fancy stuff to put on. And uh, this whole pier, uh, the main strip is down here in St. Petersburg. This whole pier go, goes out like a quarter mile into the water and then there's this tall restaurant uh, that's uh, Annabelle and Mimi they racked up a few more medals uh, in St. Petersburg and uh, you can't tell how high this is but this is that peninsula here overlooking that's the Vinoy where we stayed last time this time we rented a house because they were doing uh, construction and um, this restaurant is high up very cool place to go for lunch and they have all these different things along the pier etc and the main strip is down here. Quite quite a great city. I mean, Florida is just growing in leaps and bounds. Um, so let's get right down to it. We've got a lot of great stuff to cover today. Um, and uh, first off, I would like to thank uh, Ginny Go uh, at CNBC for having me on CNBC Squawk Box, Squawk Box Asia on Monday night our time, Tuesday morning Singapore time, uh, along with... Uh, Will Kolaris, Audrey Tay, Norman Tandon, uh, and of course, uh, Marty Soon, uh, who is also one of the hosts, a phenomenal guy. We, we had a great back and forth about uh, Elon Musk's uh, 5420, and I said maybe 6420, and he said maybe 69. Uh, you, could, you could do your interpretation of that, uh, but, but really enjoyed being on, on that, so thanks for having me there. We'll go into that in more detail as we get through to this. Then I want to thank Camelia Kilowan and Mike Walter for having me on CGTN last night to talk about Tesla earnings. Uh, we went into really good de detail on that. We'll touch on that a little bit later. And then I uh, want to thank Devik Jane and Sruthi Sankar for having me in their article on Reuters yesterday. Um, and uh, I said people came into this earnings season excessively pessimistic, overweight in cash and commodities, panic selling out of bonds and tech. Uh, but guidance is not coming down as much as people anticipated. We're going to see more of it throughout this earnings season, particularly uh, in the tech sector, which everyone could not be more pessimistic about moving into earnings season. So we're going to see that in earnest next week. Uh, the only thing that we've seen is uh, Taiwan Semi, which showed that their margins expand. They're not yet rewarded for that yet, um, but uh, time will tell on that. And then Netflix had a net miss. But with Netflix, it's interesting, and I know Ackman dumped out of his stock, but um, what's interesting about Netflix is that they do have, whatever they said, 70 million people password sharing, They cut, and it's not complicated to cut them off because I, I know someone who runs a subscription service like this has a software that you can just track it to the IP. And like when he did that, his his subscriptions went up 70%. So uh, there is a lot of password sharing going on and they could turn on the spigot overnight. What they're trying to do is get in a low cost ad based thing so that they get, you know, maybe closer to 80% of the people that they knock off versus just losing them and pissing them off saying, look, you've been getting a free ride for X, Y, Z years, we see your IP, uh, we're going to give you a free ad-based uh, version. And we'd love you to do the full version if you want, but if you can't swing it, then do this. And that's going to be 50, 70 million more subs, uh, and the 200,000 uh, that they lost is going to look like peanuts. Uh, but that may take some time, that may be till the fall, uh, but I wouldn't ever bet against Reed Hastings. Um, the next thing I wanted to cover... Um, is not that yet. I uh, wanted to cover Cigna. Uh, Cigna, we were pitching very, very hard in the fall uh, in this 195, 200, 210 range. Uh, and we said that it would work its way back up to new highs. It did that, uh, got over this 267 high earlier in the week. 
We've taken off now, um, as of this week, we took off about 30% of that. We had an options trade on that's up 150%. Uh, so that, that did what we think. We do think this has a long way more to go, uh, probably 15, 20% more. Uh, so we did keep 70% on, but we used the funds from those profits to actually add into, uh, the, uh, the weakness on BABA and the weakness on, uh, biotech this week, our two highest conviction positions and our highest weights. And what we were able to do with BABA, and I didn't think we'd get another, another chance to do it, but we did. Um, if you recall, we did like 86 basis points when it dropped to 75, we bought the December 105 calls at, I think it was 846 or something like that. Um, we were able to double that to, um, uh, now it's a hundred eighty nine basis points, uh, of additional risk. So from 20% equity plus now 189 basis points. Uh, of the December 105 calls uh, with the idea that the COVID shutdowns will stop and the stimulus will kick in and they'll juice the market into the China National Congress, which they do every five years. Obviously, it's been a little sticky with the shutdowns have, have slowed things down more than they expect and offset the stimulus uh, in the short term, but we think that's going to get resolved. Um, so what we've actually done, you know, it looks like you know, Baba wants to go back down and fill that gap to 75. And if they do that, maybe we'll have one more bite at the apple. Maybe we'll take some more profits on Cigna and, and uh, you know, maybe round that up to 250 basis points more. But um, what effectively we have was a 20% 20 20 position now turned into a 21.89% position. But the difference is because of these dislocative moves, uh, we've been able to double our exposure above $105 um, for 189 basis points worth of risk. So for every $10 million, you have $2 million of stock, you have another uh, 189,000 of options. But those 189,000 of options control $2.1 million of stock at $105 through December, and our bet is it's going to be much higher than $105 by December, in which case, uh, if it's close to intrinsic value, which I don't think it will be, we'll take profits on the options. If not, we'll just exercise the options and own, you know, $180 or $200 stock at $105 with 100% embedded uh, profit already in the stock. But effect so the, the beauty of, of what this has served up is that, um, 20% of uh, equity position control 20, 20 uh, uh, for every $10 million, $2 million of stock. But now we've got a 21.89% position that, that controls above 105, uh, 4 million, $4.1 million of stock. So it's 40% notional value and only 21.89% uh, real value. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that because that'll bring the basis down. Once those are exercised, it'll bring the basis down materially, uh, probably below 120 uh, over all in. And um, and then this thing, you know, as this thing moves up to, to intrinsic value, uh, we're, 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 we're pretty excited about it. Now, um, I, you know, I wasn't, th th look, I wasn't hoping for the stock to go fill this gap uh, back to, let's just take a look at what this, what I mean by this gap. I don't know that it's going to. Um, okay, so here's the gap when it shot down to $73, this gap here. Now, does it go and fill that? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If it does, we'll buy more. You know, the, the, the real play would be if they broke the lows and just take everyone out to the woodshed and then rip it back higher. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but you know, there's a decent chance they'll fill this gap. But keep in mind, that's not the only gap in the chart the gap down to 75. There's there's another gap up to 160 and then there's a huge gap up to 260 that also needs to be filled. So it works both ways. And I think, uh, I, I'm not sure if this gap will be filled or not, maybe it will, uh, but I can also bet in coming years that this gap will certainly be filled probably this year and this gap will certainly be filled over time and then eventually will work to new highs uh, as they continue to command share as the first mover, biggest market share in pretty much all the businesses they're in. Uh, and and we'll be off to the races. So um, uh, so th so that's how you turn lemon into lemonades. It hasn't been an easy ride for sure, 
but it's going to prove to be uh, all these short-term pain is going to lead to long-term gain. Um, so I want to thank uh, Tiho Birkin for, uh, I had a good talk with him. We talk by Zoom. He lives in Malta. He's a great follow on Twitter, by the way. You should definitely, T-I-H-O-B-R-K-A-N. He has a family office. Really exceptionally smart guy. He's like my Charlie Munger. I love talking to him. We, we now talk, uh, we have kind of a standing date every four weeks. We jump on Zoom for a couple hours and just share ideas. And he shared two articles with me today that were just um, day changing, so to speak. You know, I, I came into the morning, uh, you know, seeing Baba down a little bit, seeing uh, biotech down a little bit and uh, figuring out, you know, how, you know, uh, the good news is Cigna has had a monster run uh, and it was time to harvest a little bit of the profits and let the rest run. And I was able to use that to take advantage of the short term heaviness. I think this, you know, the good news is Powell spoke today. And what was surprising is 50 basis points is already hiked, uh, priced in. He was talking 50 basis points now is on the table. And people are like, huh? There's like a 98 point, per, you know, 90 some odd percent chance in the Fed funds futures that they're going 50. Like everyone knows they're going 50. I think the market was surprised he didn't say 75 was on the table. Um, but, um, the question is, now that he spoke, can the market relax or do they have to wait till he actually does it uh, at the May meeting and we got to deal with another week of BS, basically? I think it's the former. I think there's enough pain in the market and we'll walk to, through some of them. But the key thing that Tiho shared with me um, that was really day changing and was this article uh, by the Chandler brothers. Now, this is a rehash of the original article from institutional investor and this was in 2006 i'd never heard of these guys they're called the chandler brothers the greatest investors you've never heard of and um this is at this macro ops website which i'm also unfamiliar with but they did a really good job with this article and it says two secretive brothers from new zealand have perhaps the best long-term track record in, in in the investing world starting in 1986 the two turned 10 million dollars of family money into over five billion dollars just 20 years later that's an astounding 36% compound annual growth rate. Compare that to Buffett with 19% over 50 years, Klarman with 20% over 34 years, Lynch with 29% over 13 years, and Soros and Druckenmiller both around 30% over 30 years, yet hardly anybody has ever heard of these guys. Uh, this is by design. The two brothers have gone through great lengths to maintain a low profile, keep their faces out of the news. It wasn't until 2006 when they chose to give their first and only substantial interview to the institutional investor and they agreed to do the interview so they could counteract bad press they were receiving from a Korean media over a failed activist push by the two to upseat management in a Korean at a Korean chable. They were amongst the first investors to plunge into emerging markets like Russia, Brazil, and Czech Republic. Their son's a World War II veteran who ran a beekeeping business uh, with Edmund Hillary before starting what became New Zealand's most upscale de department store. Uh, Chandler Brothers, Richard and Christopher, they, they basically run their own money and they follow, uh, follow along with the profile of some of the secrets they've shared in how they look and invest in markets. Uh, by the way, you could, I'm not actually rushing through this. I'm going to read through this whole article because it was that impactful and it was very timely for what we're doing here. Uh, with with some of the some of our big ideas uh, okay first some quick background on the brothers and their unusual story um, okay the Chandler's investing background is anything but conventional the brothers grew up in Montangi a town out of Hamilton in New Zealand okay although he never knew his father blah 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 okay um, he never knew his father Robert was profoundly marked by the American success literature he had left behind, notably the books of Orison Sweat Martin, an early 20th century American journalist and author who had inspired such proponents of, quote, positive thinking as Dale Carnegie and Norman Vincent Peale. So for everyone who poo-poos all that stuff, uh, more people who are worth a lot of money have read that stuff than haven't. Uh, and it's usually the poor people who say that stuff is nonsense. Um, Robert's sons were deeply influenced by his worldview as well. We are great believers in the idea of having audacious goals, breaking out and doing something out of the ordinary, says Richard. It helped us turn what most people consider a mere profession into a vocation. Beyond that, an art where we frequently put ourselves in harm's way. Um, okay, so they did the 
Okay, so Richard referred to his mother uh, as the most brilliant business person I've ever met who taught us many of the key principles we follow as investors. Two of these key principles were, quote, never buy something unless you know to whom you can sell it, and two, buy as much as possible in a narrow range of hot items. Uh, Richard uh, said of his mother, quote, was able to identify the best opportunities to be the master of narrow and deep, and that with stocks we do the same thing. We back our beliefs till the hilt. The two brothers were essentially uh, getting an MBA when they were only kids. This undoubtedly shaped them into the two market masters they are today. Uh, so after college, they took over the family business, rapidly expanded its size. And in 1986, they sold it for $10 million, which they then used to launch their uh, fund, Sovereign Global. Richard remarked on the decision to sell the family business. Basically, we said, let's do something we love to do, not just something we're good at. Something they loved was investing. The fund's first investment serves as a perfect example of the style they would typify the brothers' approach. Uh, remember, these guys turned 10 million into 5 billion. And, and that's the style is, and that's contrarian to the extreme and highly concentrated. Hmm, rings a bell. Narrow and deep, just like their mother taught them. The two poured nearly the entire family fortune into just four Hong Kong office buildings in 1987. That year, the property market in Hong Kong was in dire straits. They weren't chasing trends. They weren't buying breakouts. They were buying SHIT that no one wanted, but it wasn't SHIT. You just had to, you know, break away some of the dust and, and see the gems that they were. And the real estate prices were down roughly 70% from their 1981 peaks. Britain's lease on the territory was due to lapse in the coming decade, according to Richard. The feeling was that China was going to take over Hong Kong, so most investors said, who cares? The sentiment at the time was that the island was, quote, uninvestable. Shock, shock. Uninvestable related to China interference? That never happened before. This is unprecedented. China tech is uninvestable. Well, here's what a few newspaper headlines from that year. Plunge unnerves Hong Kong. Hong so Kong suffers wild fluc fluctuations. Worries for democracy on the rise in Hong Kong. This pervasive negative sentiment and over-extrapolation of recent trends is what drew the two brothers to the place. So while everyone was running, they were running to it. And they objectively studied the fundamentals and came away with a variant perception. Richard remarked on the time that, quote, we had read the treaty and it promised the status quo for 50 years and we believed it. Even more important, rents were rising and rental yields exceeded interest rates by five percentage points, which guaranteed that any investment would more than pay for its financing costs. How is that different from Alibaba's business, although it's slowed with shutdowns and COVID and crackdowns, their business is still growing. You're just buying it at you know 60% off. Um, the brothers leveraged up and paid $27.6 million for the Aguilar Place, a 22-story building. They then <clears throat> renovated the place, which allowed them to triple rents over just three years, which gave them the cash to acquire more buildings. Lo and behold, by the way, taking Cigna profits and putting it into uh, Baba and Biotech on the weakness this week. Lo and behold, Hong Kong didn't immediately become a communist depot, despo, uh, depot as many had feared. The property market recovered and the brothers sold their buildings for $110 million, pocketing $40 million after paying off creditors, quadrupled their funds NAV in just four years' time. So they bought here in the hole when no one wanted it. They sold it in 1991 when everyone wanted it. The, the brothers also invested in Hong Kong stock index futures during this time, which they viewed as another way to play the recovery in the property market as the Hang Seng was uh, mostly made up of real estate companies at that time. But in the middle of the crash of 1987, their stop losses were hit and the brothers were forced to close out their position. The following week, markets crashed around the world and the brothers narrowly escaped a major loss. Richard said, they learned from this experience that, quote, if you get lucky once, don't press your luck. It also gave the brothers an aversion to using leverage. Being unlevered enabled the Chandlers to take a long-term view of risky markets, their key competitive advantage at a time when many investors, particular highly leveraged hedge funds, invest with a short-term horizon. A long view is critical part of their philosophy, as Richard notes the brothers, quote, like investments where the risk is time, not price. And I've talked about this many times in the past. What's your hedge? My hedge is time because I understand what I own. I'm not worried about the short-term fluctuations. It's like I don't mark rental houses to market 
every week based on whether they're rented or not. I know what the fair value is over time. So I, I, I don't take a bid for three fifty on a $500,000 rental just because it's vacant for a couple of months. Uh, and, and that's what people do with stocks and businesses all day long. With their recent winnings in Hong Kong, the brothers went looking at emerging markets. Richard recalled that, quote, the fax machine was becoming very popular and, quote, we felt the value was moving from real estate to communications. So we researched it and found that Talibras was the cheapest telecom company in the world. That was it was here that they ran into some analysis problems which led them to led to them developing a unique valuation method, which they would use again and again through their careers. At the time, Brazilian hyperinflation had rendered earnings and P.E. ratios absolutely meaningless. So they had to turn to creative metrics in this case. Market capitalization per access line. Talibris, the nation, nation's telephone monopoly, was trading at about $200 per line compared with $2,000 for Mexico's Telefono de Mexico and an average cost of $1,600 for installing a line in Brazil. The brothers bet that the government of then President Fernando Collar de Mello would liberalize the economy and open the country up to foreign investment. This practice of using unique metrics to compare and discern value is an important piece of what Richard calls, quote, the Delta Quadrant. Transition economies are distressed sectors where information is not easily available and standard metrics don't apply. After attaining government position, uh, permission to invest in Brazilian equities, Sovereign was one of the first foreign investors in the country. The brothers put $30 million, roughly 75% of their fund, into Talebra shares in 1991 and a smaller amount into Electrobras, an electric utility. This was even more contrarian bet than Hong Kong was. And by the way, right now there are Brazilian uh, and Spanish uh, and a uh, number of different telecoms around the world that are trading like death as well. Um, so um, not this was an even more contrarian bet than Hong Kong was. Not only was sentiment in the dumps in Brazil, news clippings from 1991 below, but foreign investors weren't even looking at opportunities there. The Chandler brothers were walking their own path. In Brazil, pessimism starts to keep pace with inflation rate. <laughs> inflation was out of control and pessimism was following, uh, is what this newspaper article is showing. Once Calor de Mello began cutting the budget deficit and opening the market to foreigners, Brazilian equities tripled. Uh, but soon, Calor de Mello was caught in a massive kickback scheme and was impeached that April. Stock swoon falling 60% over the next eight months. Most foreign investors fled the market, but the Chandlers sat tight after a 60% sell-off. Richard recalls the sell-off saying, quote, as far as we were concerned, the shock was external to the fundamentals of the company. Telebras had simply gone from extremely undervalued to outrageously undervalued. And that's what they figured it, they had the moat. And that's what we talk about when we talk about Alibaba in China and in Southeast Asia as uh, first mover in most businesses that they're in and in largest share, particularly the cloud. I know there was a hit piece on their cloud business uh, this week, uh, which was, uh, factually, um, well, let's just say it, it wasn't crystal clear. So they made a case that a lot of the cloud business in China is moving to state-owned enterprise cloud. Uh, and that's why Alibaba's cloud business was down last quarter. And the reason Alibaba's cloud business was down last quarter was because their biggest client, was hit by the shutdown. It was an online education provider. The business was shut off and that represented a lot of their cloud business. Uh, and, and that's what took the short term hit. It wasn't that they were losing customers to these other things. Uh, that might be a, a short term thing, but their percentage of share is so high because their quality, their foothold, their integration, their service just keeps getting better and better and better. And they're the front runners and they are going to be the AWS of China and, and most certainly Southeast Asia. Uh, that's not changing. And it's the same thing of what they had in Brazil with these phone lines. I mean, Alibaba is the Amazon of China and Southeast Asia and parts of Eastern Europe. And, uh, and first mover, and that's what uh, these brothers saw in Brazil. By 1993, the market recovered and the Chandlers sold out of their position later that year. The brothers had more than 5x their initial investment in under three years, boosting their fund to more than 150 million. Richard said the experience of riding out the volatility helped them, quote, build our emotional muscles, help, uh, helping us to make it through major falls and grind through the trying times without losing our equilibrium. I went through that. I walked you guys through with range resources um, in 2018. Let's see if I can pull this up here. Just again. Range resources. I'd 
analyze. So the uh, PV10 proven reserves were like, I'd estimated, uh, I think the proven reserves were like 23 bucks. The stock was down 90% from 92 to 11. We started buying in the high 11s and 12s. It immediately shot up to $18. Uh, we thought we were brilliant. And then it collapsed to $1.61 during COVID. We bought the hell out of it, bringing our basis down to just over $4, I think $4.10. Um, and it's a monster position. And now it's up at uh, close to over $32. So that's uh, an eight bagger at this point. We'll start peeling off in probably the low 40s, high 40s. This is the natural gas stock. We've not sold any natural gas. And my guess is this probably works its way up to new highs over the next three to five years. We'll probably peel off, you know, a quarter in the 40s, maybe uh, half in the 50s, and then let 25% let run in perpetuity and probably wind up with um, on this for, you know, probably wind up with a 15 bagger all in. Net, maybe maybe a little bit more. And no one could could do this. But why could I have confidence? Because the PV10 was 23, but they had two decades of undrilled reserves that they did they they don't report on the SEC reporting. And we estimated it was worth $63. We still think it's worth $63. But just as they overshoot on the downside and trade dramatically below book, uh, when it gets exciting, uh, nothing's really changed in the PV from when it was trading at 92. Uh, the difference is now they're more efficient and uh, and the demand is increasing around the world. Uh, so we think this probably could be a hundred dollar stock at some point, but at that point we'll probably own 25% of our position as people get more and more excited, 40, 50, 60, 70, we're going to help them out and, uh, and lay it off. No one wanted it at a buck 61. Everyone's going to want it at a hundred. And that's why it's this philosophy that where you, where you get rich, but you got to know what you own. You got to do the work. Everyone's looking for quick tips. That's not how it works. How it works is you do your homework you buy the highest quality assets when they're completely out of favor and you hold tight through all this volatility that has nothing to do with the underlying value of the business. So, um, and that's how you quote, build your emotional muscles, helping to make it through major market falls and grind through the trying times without losing equilibrium. Uh, so they bought Talibras here and then they sold it here. Etc. The brothers continued their run of highly concentrated and extremely contrarian investment with forays into Eastern Europe, South Korea, and Russia, always going into market investing in assets that no one else would touch. Because why? Because they were, quote, uninvestable. Another great example. And by the way, they were usually uninvestable because of government interference and crackdowns and nonsense or mismanagement, which, which changes. Eventually, people only take so much. You know, you guys think uh, Xi Jinping has a guaranteed five years. There are 100 families that control the show there. And if he doesn't turn things around before the CNC, he's going to be gone in a year. And that can be a catalyst. You look at Turkey. I was talking with Tiho. Uh, he had a great idea on Turkey. Uh, Erdogan, you have a change of government policy there. Those stocks could be up 3, 5x. Um, so, so these type of things happen. But you have to deal with before the change when things look, always look darkest before their dawn, which I think I said on CNBC on Monday. Uh, and um, and it's going to prove to be true. Now, uh, another great example of their approach was a big bet on Japanese banks in the early 2000s. <coughs> Institutional investor writes that, quote, in November 20, 2002, a, Jap a chip, a Japan slipping, with Japan slipping back into recession after a decade of stagnation and with stocks at 20-year lows, the Nikkei 225 index was more than 78% below its 1989 peak. Mark that number, 78% below its 1989 peak. Remember this number, 78%. 78%, 78%. We're going to come back to that. The country's banks were wallowing in bad debt. It was under this backdrop that the Ch uh, Chandlers began loading up on shares of the sector. The two bought a $570 million stake in UFJ Holdings, which had posting a static quote, which had posted a staggering loss of $9.3 billion in its latest year. The pair went on to buy more than 3% of Mizuho Financial Group, as well as stakes in Sumitomo, Mitsui Banking Group, and Mitsubishi Tokyo Financial Group. Altogether, they spent about a billion dollars on their spree. The banks were priced for a total wipeout of equity holders. Sounds like Wells Fargo in 2020 when we were pounding the table, says Sovereign Brokers at the time at Nico Citigroup, John Nicholas. Quote, we were advising our clients to stay away from the sector. Here are a few headlines from the Times showing the negative consensus of the time. 
Japanese shares fall 3.2% to a 19-year low, trapped in Japan's bank crisis. A sick banking system resists therapy. Uh, these are uh, newspaper clippings. Like in Brazil, the brothers had to be creative in the metrics they used to value the banks since they didn't have any earnings on which to base multiples and uncertainty about the extent of bad loans made it difficult to forecast a turnaround, which is why we bought when Wells Fargo was trading at a 40% discount to book, which only happened two other times in history. Um, so instead, they looked at uh, market capitalization as a percentage of assets on the daily basis. They determined that UFJ and other mega banks traded about 3% compared with 15% for Citigroup at the time. The Chandlers concluded that Japan would have to nationalize the banks or reflate the economy with low interest rates and bet correctly as it turns out on the latter scenario. So, by the way, this is interesting. They started buying here at 100 down 90%. By the way, this looks exactly like the range resources and in some ways the, the Alibaba. Uh, so, so after riding out a near 50% decline from when they began building their position, because they bought here a year and a half later, it was down 50%. Um, the Chandler brothers rode the stock all the way back up to new multi-year highs back up to here. They were still sitting in the stock in 2006 when I interviewed when the uh, in institutional investor interview was conducted. So they bought here, they bought down 90%. This looks exactly like range resources. It went down another 50%. Uh, and then over the next two years, it worked back up to new highs. And in talking about their big win in Japan, why, why could they do that? Why would they take a 50% loss? Um, most everyone would have sold here when it broke down below support. And they would have missed all of this. And that's that's why they'll never have real fortunes because uh, they don't know what they own. So therefore, they don't have any conviction. And they're looking at squiggly lines on a chart and, uh, you know, getting hit by uh, st they're stopped getting hit by high frequency traders that know exactly where their stops are placed. Uh, like they think they're hidden when their flow is sold to, sold from underneath them. Anyway, in talking about their their big win with with Japan, Richard said, quote, most fund managers are focused on what can go wrong rather than what can go right. And we were too afraid to make that call. And they were too afraid to make that call. We were not. Talk about having the courage of your convictions. These guys must have to push around a wheelbarrow to haul their giant cojones around. <laughs> okay. Richard helped shed light on how he and his brother are so effectively greedy when others are fearful and sharing one of his favorite sayings from investor Philip Carrot, who said it is essential, quote, to seek facts diligently advice never. Richard explains, quote, money managers have to account for their actions to their shareholders, which means they have an undue fear of underperformance. We invest only our own money. Our investment decisions are driven by optimism and fear. And this is why I keep my minimum so high, because the type of people I attract understand this. That's why they're already rich. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't really care what happens in 12 or 24 months, so long as they believe that the asset is high quality and that we're buying it on sale and they can deal with this to ultimately get this and that's why i've keep my kept my um minimums up so so high uh and it served me well so once they establish the conviction that they they then have the optimism and courage to buy in size uh intelligent investor writes the brothers also prize scale believing that the way to achieve outsized returns is to make a few big bets Sovereign usually holds fewer than 10 stocks rather than manage a diverse portfolio. Chandler's favor a large cap stocks. And ah, this is critically important. And I've emphasized this over and over. The Chandler's favor large cap stocks in big countries. Quote, if you are invested in big companies in big countries, we have the number one company in the number two economy in the world, by the way, with Alibaba. That means there is a ready audience of benchmark following investors who must Buy the asset, says Richard. By buying big, narrow, and deep, as opposed to diversifying, you maximize your success. Sovereign usually holds fewer than 10 equity positions at any one time, though typically holds its larger positions for two to five years. The firm regularly trades in and out of some stocks to test the waters and take advantage of price movements. It's very important to note that this isn't dumb, blind conviction. You're not a smart contrarian just by buying hated falling asset. You don't see us buying small cap Chinese stocks that, you know, 50% are riddled with fraud. We buy the biggest and the best, basically betting that the end of Alibaba would be the end of China, which is not far from the truth. And we're going to talk about some of these uh, different factors that caused the Chinese government to turn around their policy stance in the last few weeks. Uh, the crowd could be correct and the underlying could be worth much less than it's selling for. And that's why you have to do your work. 
The Chandlers lived in breed business from the time they were children. Richard had a degree in accounting. After college, he worked in, okay, the two-note business. Da, 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 da. Our talent is to understand. Our talent is to understand the long-term potential of a business, and the market gives you the opportunity to arbitrage what the emotional investor will pay or sell at, at versus the fundamental value of the company. But you've got to pull the trigger promptly without hesitating. We've disciplined ourselves mentally and prepared ourselves in terms of the information as well as relationships with brokers to do just that. So lessons from the Chandler brothers, narrow and deep. That means putting a large part of your portfolio into just a few high conviction trades. The veritable fat pitches when they come along. Uh, we call this fat tail exploitation theory, FET. And it flies in the face of all conventional wisdom that espouses the wonders of diversification. Drucken Miller talked about the importance of FET when he said the following. The first thing I heard when I got in this business from my mentor was bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered. I'm here to tell you that I was a pig. And I strongly believe the only way to make long-term returns in our business that are superior is by being a pig. I think diversification and all that stuff they're teaching at business school today is probably the most misguided concept everywhere. And if you look at the greatest investors that are as different as Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, Carl Langone, uh, Ken Langone rather, they tend to be very, very concentrated bets. They see something, they bet it, and they bet the ranch on it. By the way, Elon Musk is no different. He's gone all in on everything he's ever done and sometimes more than all in. And that's that's the kind of that's kind of the way my philosophy evolved, which was if you see only maybe one or two times a year, do you see something that really, really excites you? The mistake, by the way, which is why every week we're talking about biotech and Baba, you know, you can only get a couple of good ideas a year uh, that you can lean into. Um, see something that really, really excites you. The mistake I'd say 98 percent of money managers and individuals make is they feel that they've got to be playing in a bunch of stuff. And if you really see that. And if you really see it, put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket very carefully. And Barton Biggs touched on this in his book, Hedgehogging, when writing about his friend and macro manager, Tim. To get really big long-term returns, you have to be a pig and ride your winners. When he lacks conviction, he reduces his leverage and takes off his bets. He describes this as staying very close to shore. Um... Okay. And uh, he describes this as, quote, staying close to shore. When I asked him how he got his investment ideas, at first he was at a loss. Then, after thinking about it, he said that the trick was to accumulate over time a knowledge base. That's how, by the way, Warren Buffett can do the deals to Bank of America and Goldman Sachs during the great financial crisis while sitting in his bathtub after five minutes on the phone, uh, where most people would spend five out, five months doing due diligence and the opportunity passes them by. You see these things over and over and over, and when they, the dislocations happen, you're ready to pounce, and you can only get that through time and experience. Then, out of the blue, some event or new piece of information triggers a thought process, and suddenly you've discovered an investment opportunity. You can't force it. You have to be patient. You have to wait for the light goes on. If it doesn't go on, stay close to shore. Um, okay, another reason why FAT is a key to delivering outsized returns is because of the underlying power laws that are embedded in the market. Pareto's Law of 80-20 or in markets it's more like 90-10 or even 95-5, means that 90% of your returns will come from 10% or fewer of your trades. That's absolutely true. Just look at the profile of Sovereign's returns over a 15-year period. Just five investments generated 90% of all of their returns. Over the past 15 years, five investments generated all their returns. So uh, Mosinegro was a four-year bet, which was 3.8x. Uh, Unified Energy Systems, 4.3x. Uh, UFJ Holdings was 156%. SK Corp was uh, 4.3x. Mizuho Financial was 3.5x, etc., etc., etc. Second is time. Fat pitches like these don't come around often. The Chandlers would often go years between big investments without risking any substantial amount of money. Genius. Michelangelo once said that, quote, genius is infinite patience. Uh, well, the corollary to that investing is that infinite patience is success. Joel Greenblatt said this about the need for patience and taking big, big picture view of things. Uh, quote, Leg Mason's Bill Miller calls it time arbitrage. We've talked about this a lot. That means looking further out than anyone else does. All of these companies have short-term problems and potentially some of them have long-term problems, but everyone knows what the problems are. Next is there's contrarianism. Uh, Chandler Brothers made it a point to set up shop in Dubai and Singapore, far away from their financial centers of the world in New York and London. They did this because they don't didn't want to fall victim of the power gull, powerful gull pull of groupthink and herd mentality. I often work out of Connecticut, and I'm not in Greenwich where all the hedge fund managers is. I, at my club, it's all business owners, real estate guys, insurance guys, uh, you know, couple 
uh, you know, big financial advisors, but uh, I'm not stuck in groupthink. I'm, I, I'm around business people versus versus that. I go into the city, you know, frequently enough, but um, I, I try to be an independent thinker and, and I think you'll find that I am. Uh, being able to look at the same situation as the market from a variant perception lies at the heart of how they uncover the highly asymmetric trades. Good way to develop a variant perception is to take a page from Plain Drum George Soros who said, the generally accepted view is that markets are always right. That is, market prices tend to discount future developments accurately, even when it is unclear what those developments are. I start with the opposite view. I believe the market prices are always wrong in the sense that they present a biased view of the future. As humans, we all have the tendency to get wrapped up in the hysteria and be seduced by compelling narratives, especially when the components of fear and greed are present. But it's in these situations where the narrative has driven the market to extrapolate trends ad infinitum, driving prices to ridiculous levels. That can, on both sides, by the way, that can create the environment where amazingly asymmetric bets uh, exist. You need to step back objectively, sift through the data yourself, develop big picture view of things. That's what Templeton referred to as, quote, the point of maximum pessimism, which Bill Miller explains here. The securities we typically analyze are those that reflect behavioral anomalies arising from largely emotional reactions to events. In the broadest sense, those securities reflect low expectations of future value creation, usually arising from either macroeconomic or microeconomic events or fears. It's almost like this article is written for Alibaba. Our research efforts are oriented toward determining whether a large gap exists between those low embedded expectations and the likely intrinsic view of the security. The ideal security is one that exhibits what Sir John Templeton referred to as, quote, the maximum point, the point of maximum pessimism. Uh, lastly, you need to be creative and think out of the box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the story here. A couple more points from the source article. Um, okay, we covered this. Uh, brothers also believe in prize scale, believing the way to achieve outsized returns is to make a few big bets. Sovereign usually holds fewer than 10 stocks rather than manage a diverse portfolio. Chandler's favor large cap stocks in big countries. If you're invested in big companies in big countries, that means there is ready audience of benchmark following investors to buy the asset. Um, and and that, that's the whole name of the game. And, uh, and not only do we get the benefit when people go back into rushing back into China, we get the benefit when they rush into emerging markets because China is the biggest weight of emerging markets and Alibaba is one of the biggest weights in China. So as those flows change, so will uh, everything else. Now take a look at this. Chinese imports already recessionary. So Bank of America put this out as a negative. Well, I'm going to show you how it's a positive um, because uh, if you recall, I talked about uh, here's the magnitude of the rallies in the Hang Seng Index when it trades below book value. If you remember, it's traded, uh, I, I think it's just below book value still at 0.99. This chart was from you know a month or two ago. Uh, it did this in 1998 and then... Uh, over the next 17 months, it was up 156%. So take a look at 1998. Oh, surprise, surprise. Chinese imports were, quote, already recessionary. That was the time to buy, not the time to dump. You don't use this to get out. You use this to get in, okay? The market is a discounting me mechanism. 2008, okay, the market traded near a discount to book. The next 21 months, it was up 110%. What was happening in 2008 with China imports already recessionary? Yeah, they were already recessionary, all right. This wasn't a reason to get out. This was a reason to get in if you like 110% rallies in the index and probably 200% in the top weighted companies in that index. 2016, it traded below book. The, the Hang Seng was up 82.52% in the next 23 months, which is now uh, tech weighted. Well, what were Chinese imports already saying in 2018? It was saying they were already recessionary, even more recessionary than they are today. And uh, you're up 82.5%. By the way, in that 2018, Alibaba doubled the returns when the Hang Seng rallied 82% in 2016. Alibaba rallied 234%. Uh, when the Hang Seng rallied off a uh, discounted book in 2020 of 35.9% in 11 months, the Alibaba rallied 70% over that same period. So uh, right here, 70.2%. So, um, so 2016 and then 2020, oh, surprise, surprise, the Chinese imports were already recessionary. So 
everyone is selling this, this news that you want to be buying this news. Now, we're going to get back to the magic number here. So, by the way, so is it just Alibaba going back to test the lows? No, it's all of all of these Chinese companies uh, are doing it. Uh, China Life, uh, NetEase, um, they, they're all trading together until they don't. Uh, Li Auto, Baidu's making the same pattern. Neo's making the same pattern. JD's making the same pattern. Pinduoduo is making the same pattern. They're all the same trade. Um, we just like Alibaba because it's the biggest and it has the biggest moat. And if they go down, China goes down. So um, now, why were we emphasizing that 78% drawdown when they bought the banks in uh, Japan? Because let, let, let me take you through three of the biggest meltdowns in the history of the world. Number one, the Great Depression. From 1929 to 1932, you can see it here. This is the Dow Jones where I have data going back that far. The Dow Jones dropped 89.5% over uh, two and a half years before bottoming out and off to the races. Okay, so then the next year was up 130%, 40 to 110 or whatever, uh, almost 200% rather. Uh, 120 would have been 200%. But um, so it dropped 89.5. That was the Great Depression. You know, when they didn't really get monetary policy and you had a hawk in, as the president and all, all this other stuff. Okay, so that was one big 89.5%. Here is the tech wreck, the NASDAQ composite from 2000 to 2002. Over a period of two and a half years, the NASDAQ composite, which was one of the biggest tech wrecks of all time, dropped 78.9%, exactly like the Japanese uh, index. And uh, that's when you wanted to be a buyer, not a seller. So would you have wanted to buy the Dow after this monster crash or sell it in the Great Depression? If you had bought the Dow at 41 points and now we're at, you know, uh, whatever, 40,000 uh, in the neighborhood of, that would be a pretty damn good return. Now, if you um, bought the NASDAQ in 2002 at 1100 and we're now at uh, 14,000. That would be a pretty good, pretty good trade. So when you're buying, quote unquote, the biggest companies or the biggest indices that are down 80 or 90 percent, you're not buying small stuff that can go to, you know, go away. Um, the odds dramatically improve. And, and in those two instances, these were generational buy opportunities. Well, let's take a look at one more generational buy opportunity. Oh, it's KWeb, the China Internet ETF. It's down 79.4%. It had the tech wreck. The only difference is it did it not in two and a half years to get down 80%. Well, this was, uh, okay, yeah, I got to stretch this out. So it was two and a half years to whatever it was, 2000. And yeah, so not in... 1. Yeah, about two and a half years. It did it in one year. Okay, basically one year it did the whole 79 generational buy opportunity. Now, could it could it be the Great Depression and could it go down another 10%? Anything is possible, but at some point you got to step in when you find value. And that's exactly what the market has served up. And during this period, the fundamentals of the biggest businesses in the world, like the Tencent, like the JD, uh, well, I, I, I'm, JD, I don't know enough to, about to talk about, but like the Tencent and like the Alibaba have gotten better, not worse. The growth has accelerated, but de decelerated because of shutting down the world and supply chain issues and, and rolling COVIDs and all of that stuff and crackdowns. Uh, but they've grown through that. Imagine what's going to happen when you take the governors off and that's what I got from my conversation with my buddy Tiho. It's just one thought triggers another thought, triggers another thought, triggers another thought. And it was just like, you know, <laughs> there you go. Is it time to, do you buy 
in the Great Depression and you know go from forty dollars to forty thousand? Uh, do you buy during the tech wreck and go from eleven hundred to fourteen thousand? Do you buy uh, China Tech down eighty percent? Not not tiny little businesses, the biggest moats, the biggest in the world, uh, and 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 eventually they all not only work back up to new highs, but like in Japan, like in, with Nasdaq, like with you know I talk about fair value of of Alibaba. At, you know, 280 to 300 and people are like, oh my God, that's crazy. That's nothing compared to, that's, that's what, you know, I have to look in a reasonable time frame of, you know, two to five years. Uh, if you look from five to 10 years, what, what Alibaba can be in Southeast Asia and everything else, I mean, four or 500 is, is reasonable. I mean, it could be worth a lot more, but the question is, what's your CAGR, what's your compound annual growth rate? I mean, it's one thing to go from 100 to 500 in seven years, it's a completely different CAGR if it takes 15 years. So that's why we talk about what do we think we can do in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, look, I'll tell you what, we're 50 minutes in. We've got a lot to cover. I think if you learn that, you can hang up and, and call it a day. If you want to learn a lot more, we've got a ton more to cover. Uh, stick around. Those of you on the podcast, uh, you're going to get cut off in nine minutes. Just go to hedgefundtips.com. By the way, click on terms. All of this is opinion, not advice. Um, and let me move this box back up here. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I always say, first off that, that article I writ, compare, wrote in December comparing Alibaba, you know, growing 900% in seven years and you could buy the stock at the same price compared to Microsoft from 2006 to 2013, growing a hundred percent, the stock doing nothing. Then it was up 1500%. I always say that was the most important article I ever wrote. Uh, I, uh, then th that guy, uh, Sam Rowe put out that article about Bill, um, about, um, Peter Lynch talking about earnings and how the S&P always follows earnings, earnings grow at 8% a year and, and eventually that, that'll follow and the price deviates around the trend. That was a very important article, but I think what I just covered with you, uh, was equally as important. It was a, it was basically a compilation of everything we've talked about over the last two, two and a half years in this podcast video cast boiled down to to one case study uh, supported by multiple case studies throughout history. So uh, that I'd, I'd read and reread that and uh, and go through this because if you can master that and unfortunately you're not going to be able to master that without the experience of going through it and the experience of knowing how to value things. But um, you're on your way and you're, you're well ahead of um, well ahead of the curve with that. I'm not sure why this is open. So either it's the wrong, it's probably the wrong thing. Okay, moving right along. All right. Um, okay, I must have left a lot of these open as I was re looking for, yeah, I was looking for the stuff. Okay. All right, so now we're going to get to the general market. Um, these are ratio charts. Uh, this I just drew up just so you could get a sense of the magnitude of where we are in terms of uh, what 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 it's looked like. Uh, this is the ratio chart of the XBI equal weighted biotech ETF relative to the SPX. And what it looks like at extremes before you get monster rallies in the sector. The biggest rally that we've discussed over and over was the uh, during the last tightening cycle, the uh, biotech XBI crashed 50%, which it's just done um, uh, in 2000. It crashed 2015 in anticipation of the tightening cycle, which happened from 2016 to 2018. Uh, and we just had the crash from February of last year till uh, till now of 50% in the XBI in anticipation of the tightening cycle. So these things come down in anticipation of the first rate hike. And then once the first rate hike, hike happens, they start to find a bottom, find their footing, and then they start to rally. And that, that's where we are now. And that's what this, this looked like in those instances. And then again, in this rally uh, off of um, the COVID lows before rolling back over. So it just shows how extreme it is in the ratio. 
Here's another ratio chart of communication sector right now, which is like Amazon and all these things. These things have just collapsed relative to the S&P 500. They did the same thing in 2018 before a run, 2016, etc. So keep your eye on some of these things that everyone hates. This is the IBB. That's just another um, biotech ETF. Uh, defense, uh, which we were hammering at last fall when it was at this extreme, is now really starting to outperform relative to the S&P. I think that's going to persist. Defense spending, which we've covered in recent weeks, is at uh, multi-decade lows. That's that's going to change even if the war ended tomorrow, which it probably won't. Uh, and um, and we're going to see that that rise. And we particularly want to be in defense companies that also happen to make and service airplane engines because the recovery trade and the airline travel demand is is just going to explode over the next few years higher. And you're already seeing it this week with earnings, which we'll cover in a second. And this is what KWeb looked like. Um, the, the magnitude of this extreme, which is a Great Depression type or tech wreck type crash. And if you, you know, it's so funny because if I said to you guys, if you had a chance to buy the Dow Jones in 1932 after a 90% crash or the NASDAQ in 2003 after an 80% crash, how much would you put into it? And you'd say, I'd lever everything. I'd sell everything under the sun. I'd be so rich right now. And yet when the China Tech is uh, doing it and not China Tech like little crap companies like China Tech that have 40% of the biggest, second biggest economy in the world and the fastest growing parts in Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe of the world with growing populations and increasing middle class, uh, not declining markets, uh, no one wants it. And that's exactly what those brothers from New Zealand were talking about, who I never heard of before talking to Tiho today. So really big hat tip to Tiho uh, for bringing that uh, a good good friend. So, um, so that's where we are now. And I'm not saying, by the way, sell everything and mortgage everything and blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying anything like that. You know, if some of you shouldn't be in it at all. But um, I am saying that's probably the magnitude of what we're looking at over the next five plus years uh, based on based on where we are. And, and, and look, anything could go wrong, which is why that fund who put 80 percent in it in uh, UK that had all, all outside money is probably not going to be around to benefit when this thing is a multi bagger down the road because they were too concentrated for outside money. And that's why we found creative ways to now have a notional 41% exposure for a less than 22% risk, uh, which is acceptable based on the margin of safety we believe it is in the in the stock at this price. Um, so, um, so that's that. All right. Uh, this is for the general indices. PMO by all, one of my favorite overall indices. It hit zero. It's curving back up. I think we're going to work our ways to new highs. And by the way, the work our ways to new highs is exactly what I was pounding the table on in uh, the fall as it relates to Cigna. And what's it done? It's worked its way to new highs and, um, and, uh, and become a funding source to put more into our two highest conviction trades this week as everyone sold them off because they were afraid Jay Powell was going to say something that everyone already knew. And this has got a lot more runway, by the way. It was just highest and best use. Another 20% here versus another opportunity that I can make 10 bagger plus on options and or uh, notional exposure if we exercise the options and hold the stock. So um, other indicators. So that's kind of my one of my favorites. This is the uh, McClellan Oscillator. It's time to buy, not sell. Uh, same here. All the NASDAQ indicators are, are near buying points versus selling points. Uh, here's the NYSE one that looks like it's starting to curve back up. And um, all right, so now we're with China news. Uh, don't throw China out with the Russian bath water. In the long term, investment risk from the ties between Beijing and Moscow are overstated, according to Clock Tower's Marco Papik. We agree. China home prices fall at a slower pace amid easing measures. China home prices fell at a slower pace in March after authorities took further steps to prevent a worsening of a prolonged downturn in the real estate industry. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this points to what we've been talking about. They are throwing the kitchen sink at it. It's not being felt yet because the cities are still partially shut down, although that changed this week, but no one's focused on it. China infrastructure approvals already 70% of last year's total. 
We're only a third into the year and they're at 70% of infrastructure approvals. Beijing is accelerating investment to help boost the economy. Um, NDRC to address risk uh, COVID poses to the supply chain. PBOC urges loans to logistic firms to ease the supply chain pain. China's central bank moves uh, takes modest easing path despite COVID. PBOC refrains from policy cut, but they did lower the reserve requirement ratio as we anticipated by 25 basis points. Uh, they've got more gunpowder there. They're going to use it. China urges banks to cut deposit rates to, in a bid to support economy. Banks urge to cut premium offered over benchmark deposit rate. The reduction could pave the way to lower lending rates. So they're, they're getting at it in a multitude of different ways. Uh, this is from the New York Times. China, unlike other countries, seeks more lending to help its economy. Economic policy in China is moving in the opposite direction from most of the rest of the world. I covered this extensively in the CNBC interview this week where I said that while the rest of the developed world is easing, uh, excuse me, is tightening aggressively, China is the only country in the world that's aggressively easing both on the monetary and fiscal front. And that's why we think it's a generational buy opportunity. And the guy looked at me like I had, you know, three heads. Uh, but, um, it, you know, that that is what it, it would it would be like buying in 2003 after the Nasdaq was down 89%. It would be like uh, 78% rather. It would be like buying during the Great Depression after it was down 89%. It's not like an individual. So the point is, is that you buy high quality when it's on sale. That You always have to go up in the quality structure. And then when markets stabilize and normalize and are on surer footing, uh, and the, the the highest quality has moved up close to fair value. That's when you can get the second tier stuff. When the overall economy is warm, everything's good. It's time to jump in the water. The laggard, lower quality things can have the secondary moves, and that's when you can dip your toes in that. But not when you're in the middle of the firestorm. The firestorm, you've got to take safe harbor in the biggest and the best, and that are uh, dramatically on sale. China's commitment to zero COVID undermines support for the market. That's I, I covered that in the. Uh, interview. I said the reason it's not felt, number one, it takes, you know, four to six to nine months to be felt in the real economy. Uh, easing works on a lag basis, just like tightening works on a lag basis, which is why we won't have a recession in the U.S. until late next year, and it'll probably be mild. Um, China's commitment to, co um, okay, and, and, and it was being undermined by the shutdowns. Once the shutdowns are lifted, then we're off to the races. Now, uh, the People's Bank of China on Friday lowered bank's reserve requirement ratio by one quarter of a percentage point to a weighted average of 8.1%, freeing up 530 billion yuan, the equivalent of $83 billion on bank's balance sheet that can be funneled into new loans. The ratio allows the central bank to vary the amount of reserves banks are required to hold, uh, measured as a proportion of their deposit. The cut takes a place, uh, takes effect April 25th. And some smaller banks will get an additional quarter of a percentage point cut, the PBOC said in a statement. Central banks said it will keep a close eye on inflation and shifts in policy by other central banks. So that's that. Next, uh, this is why the reason that China shifted gears on the auditing to allow the auditors, and it's not like done, done, but it's basically done to um, review their books, is because... Five days before, Tencent and um, Alibaba had announced 20% uh, job cuts. So they were cutting 20% of their workforce because of the effect of the crackdown. And this article goes through company by company how many people they've laid off. Um, so here at the education stocks, they laid off 90% of their workforce. Um, here's another one. 50% 50, 50 of their workforce. New Oriental Education, 40,000 people. KE laid off 100% of their people. They went out of business. ByteDance, 30 to 70%. They have TikTok. That business is growing. Uh, nice to on, 80%. Uh, IQUI, 20 to 40%. Tencent, 20%. They lost 12,000 people. Um, Moguje, which is owned by Tencent, 30% of their people they laid off. Um, Didi, 20% of the people. Alibaba, 30% they laid off. JD, 10 to 30%. Look, so they're, they're now stepping on the gas. They've done an about face. 
Uh, short term, it's 72,000 employees, but it's more like hundreds of thousands. And then you lock them down with no food and everything else in Shanghai. They're going to get riots and social unrest, and they're going to have to turn on the spigots, and they're going to actually have to put stimulus in people's pockets like the Western world did during COVID, give them checks for spending, and you're going to see <laughs> spending go through the roof. And why are they going to do that? Because they're benevolent dictators? No, because they want to keep their power and they don't want riots in the street and they don't want uh, violent overthrows, which, which has been known to happen from time to time around the world if you read a history book. So, you know, bottom line, the number one formula, if you want to get, uh, 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 if you want to see a coup happen, just starve people. I mean, you, you, you lock them up and they can't get access to food like has happened in Shanghai in the last few weeks with their stupid COVID poli uh, zero COVID policy that hasn't worked and shut down the economy. Um, I mean, look, stupid is not stupid. They're trying to do their, the best that they think is in their interest, but it's, you know, unequivocally not in their interest. The problem is, is they have no immunity because they've done the zero COVID from day one. What they need to do is roll out their uh, private label Paxlovid, which they licensed to five or six generic producers in China, get that out, produce that thing day and night, which they have the capacity to do, you know, a couple hundred million pills and let people go about their business and everyone has a pill in their pocket. You get a fever, take the pill, let's go back to work. And I think they're going to get to that point once the production is up, up and running. Uh, now, in the context, I mean, what's so amazing about this is China's first quarter GDP beat expectations to grow at 4.8% year on year versus um, uh, expectations of 4.4%. So it just shows like the amount of stimulus in the economy, they can shut down one of their biggest cities for a month, basically, and still beat expectations on GDP uh, in this context. Imagine when they open the doors. It's like they've got a Ferrari that's floored in fifth gear and they've got their foot on the gas foot on the brake at the same time the car is smoking it wants to go it's got all this pent up energy and all they have to do is take the foot off the brake and the thing will rock it and i think we're going to see that sooner or later at some point the pain will get so big that rather than seize the car they'll take the foot off the brake and the thing will absolutely rock it and win the race uh it's just a question of when and that's why you have time arbitrage and that's why you don't get uh, into leverage and margin debt because you can deal with these short-term vicissitudes. Um, now, this is from uh, the guy who runs the K-Web ETF. I read his stuff. It's called China Last Night. I read it every day. Um, all right. I don't know if this is it. Okay, I think... Okay, related take place. Okay, I don't know if that was the one, but the oh, okay, yeah, this one, this is the one. All right, so he said that a source in China told me that once the comment, okay, our friend Jonathan asked about the two week comment period ending last Saturday, addressing the CSRC's proposal to eliminate the rule prohibiting the PCAOB from doing on-site audit inspections in China. A source in the China told me that once the comment period ends, there's usually time before the adjustment takes place. When this happens, it could be a very positive development. This rule has prevented the auditors of U.S. listed companies from allowing the PCAOB to conduct audit reviews. Uh, it is feasible that the Chinese, U.S. and Chinese are talking about this rule going away through that is pure speculation on my part. Uh, it is also possible that China simply removes the rule uh, remember that the eight holding foreign company accountable act states that mainland auditors need to be PCAOB approved. So, so there's movement on that front. Next, this was really interesting, not covered today. China to launch private pensions in a bid to unlock vast saving stockpile. So the scheme aims to send funds flowing into the country's financial markets. Basically, they want to make social security uh, privatized so it can go into their stock market. Imagine if we took the Social Security system, which Bush tried to do in the early 2000s, and just made it like an IRA where people could invest in index funds, what would happen to the stock market? Uh, with 
you know, trillions and trillions of dollars. And that's exactly what China now wants to do. They're forcing their insurance companies to buy stocks. They're enforcing their companies to buy back stock. Remember, Baba has, still has $16 billion outstanding on its buyback program. And now they're forcing individuals to buy stocks because they're going to privatize the, the uh, private pensions and uh, make them available to invest in stocks. And what's the, one of the biggest weight stocks in China? You guessed it, Alibaba and Tencent. Shanghai factory sputter towards reopening as city aims to ease lockdown. The Tesla Shanghai Gigafactory is, is reopening on a closed loop system. Many others are doing that as well. Uh, Shanghai allows 4 million out of their homes as COVID lockdown rules ease. Uh, Hong Kong reports 613 new COVID cases as, as infections decline. So no one's reporting on this stuff, only that it's bad, not, not what's getting better. Um, Voting with their feet, China's wealthy look to leave after Shanghai lockdown. Look, as I said last week, the guy I talked to from San Francisco, uh, Yukao, eh, eh, he came here 10, 15 years ago. He's got all his friends back in China. He was telling me 100 families control the thing. If, if you know, they're not going to lose their wealth. If Xi doesn't change his tune, he's going to be out, regardless of the China National Congress or whatever. It may take a year. It may take two years. So I think this is evident and this is what's behind all of the stimulus, fiscal, monetary, the about face on the uh, accounting standards, etc. cetera. Uh, coronavirus, Shanghai's new COVID-19 cases call, fall to 15-day low. By the way, this is in the uh, South China Morning Post. I didn't hear this on any of the major networks today. Uh, Shanghai's new COVID cases fall to 15-day low as focus shifts to curbing spillovers. So... Um, so that's that. Boeing to restart 787 Dreamliner deliveries in second half of 2022. That's good news there. China Eastern Airlines resumes flights of the Boeing 737 model involved in the crash. So the government, Chinese government just said, you can start flying it again. And they, they have started flying the 737-800. Uh, but they did not say like, you can fly it again because we know it's safe because it was actually an error of maintenance and or the pilot committing suicide. That they won't disclose. They'll just say, you can go fly it again. We don't know if it's... So it wasn't Boeing is really what it comes down to. We'll never know the reason, but the key is it's back up in the air as we knew. It wasn't the 737-800, and uh, now the next step is the 737 MAX. God God knows when the hell that's going to happen. It was supposed to happen four months ago, but it will happen sooner or later. Why? Because they love us? No, because they need the damn planes, and sooner or later, uh, they're going to be on the back of the line behind everyone else and they're not going to be able to get the planes and it's going to hurt them. Delta's earnings were a bright spot for travel. American and United are the next test. So Delta crushed it. Then American was the next test. American Airlines sees a return to profitability. Stock is soaring. So it's off to the races. And we've been talking about defense companies that build and service uh, airline engines. We've been talking about the the uh, the airlines themselves. We've been talking about cruise lines. We've been pounding the table now. That's starting to work. Just like Cigna, we were pounding the table in the fall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The stuff it, it usually takes a little longer than you think, but it, it you can't buy high quality when it's on sale and it just doesn't work out over time. It's time arbitrage. The only way you hurt yourself is if you go on leverage and you have to get out before the thesis plays out. Um, but if you know what you own, it 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 works out sooner or later. It always works out. Uh, a rally in the stock market is imminent after investors got too bearish and as inflation starts to moderate, according to JP Morgan. This is Kalanovic, one of my favorite strategists. And what he says here is one can construct a barbell portfolio of traditional growth, e.g. tech, biotech, innovation, and traditional value stocks, metals, and mines that currently have favorable attributes across most traditional factors. I agree with him on the... Uh, so. The one thing that he said when he was live on CNBC, though, which he actually, which I put in the um, article of the week, is uh, he emphasized China ADRs. So he said, an example is China technology stocks and ADRs, many of which trade at all-time low multiples and hence rank highly on both value and growth factors. Moreover, while the U.S. is increasing interest rate, China is easing monetary policy. Maybe he heard my interview the day before, uh, which should represent a tailwind for growth stocks. So uh, there's no question about it. And um, okay, so 
If you're wondering, though, when is value tech, biotech, and China tech going to finish their bear markets and roar higher, you only need to look at one chart, which we referenced in the last couple of weeks. Uh, here's the original the, and denoted with multiple other takes. So this is the long-term uh, TLT, uh, uh, long, long bonds here coming up against this long-term resistance over the last 20 years. Uh, we think it's going to hold here, similar to how it did in 2014, uh, and start to move higher. And um, you can see here when yields started to reverse uh, yesterday, today, a little bit, uh, two steps forward yesterday, one step back today, but I think we're going to work higher here. We, you can look at the different RSI points at the same levels when it got this extended, you usually got reversals. Uh, this was from Brian Rich. Uh, he does, I think he's on Twitter. He does a, he did this, showed a technical reversal signal outside day. Uh, okay, that's fine. That was yesterday. Uh, this is the from Kimball charts uh, showing this long term. This is just the inverse of this. This is the bonds. These go up, yields go down. This is the yields. They're approaching that 20, not 20 years. In his case, he's got 30 year downtrend line, uh, which it's hit and bounced, uh, uh, bounced off of. So it looks like that trend line is up around three point yeah this is 2.91 so it could go as high as three before bouncing off of that and then he shows how extended it was when it got down to like 50 basis points and how extended it is above the trend for this ppo indicator which is like a relative strength indicator uh the last time it it inverted uh was when it got 70 percent below the 80 week moving average it's now 77 percent above Remember, it never goes back to average. It overshoots on the downside and overshoots on the upside. So he's pointing to the fact that odds favor a rolling over. We agree. Uh, this is Danny Berger. She's a reporter at Bloomberg. BlackRock's TLT is now down 28% from its highs, the worst ever. So most people view that as a sell signal. We view that as, oh, that, that looks like it's potentially a buy opportunity. Um, and then Carter Braxton Worth of Worth Charting, same same chart. Um, uh, we've now come to a point where the market is priced in more rate hikes than are likely to occur. As a result, we believe regarding yields that either A, the rate of change will grind to a halt, or B, more likely actually reverse. Once bonds get bid, it will be an attempt, an abrupt rotation as no one is positioned for it. We covered this last week. Everyone's in cash and commodities, dumping out of bonds and tech. Uh, uh, everything, everything they've been crowding into will get sold down. Everything they've been puking out will get bid. So if you want to know when the tide will turn, watch bonds. Then buy what no one else has wanted of late. Biotech, China Tech, Value Tech. Marco Kalanovic makes this point in his note. Uh, in last week's uh, Peak Everything article, we drilled down on CPI and inflation. This week, we started to see some more favorable data points. This is Shipper's view of rates over the next three months rolling over. Uh, this, this aligns with the CAS rate index, which we covered a few weeks ago. Uh, this is the CNBC interview on rates and biotech. I would, I would watch this. It was uh, really comprehensive, 13 full minutes. They gave me the, the reason I have this broken down into a few videos is they gave me the good quality copies um, that they posted on uh, Twitter and on the CNBC website. Uh, this one's on rates and biotech. This one's on China and Alibaba. This one's on Elon Musk and Twitter where we had that joke. And this is a full 13 minute segment. I screencast record this, so the quality is not as good, but you can get the whole 13 minutes, which is not covered in these clips. Uh, so if you can take a little grainier picture, I would I would do the whole thing if you have time. Uh, and then these are all my notes from the segment. Obviously, in segments, you wind up going all around and not related to the notes based on what they ask you. Um, and it's covered a lot of the points that we've emphasized over uh, recent weeks, but certainly worth a review. Uh, especially when the price is is doing silly things you just got to get back to the facts uh, and leave the emotions out of it um, and then the cgtn interview with um, mike walter um, to discuss tesla earnings elon musk and a deal for twitter i mean you know this is one of those stocks the, these earnings couldn't have been any better i mean the question is Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Things trading at 96 times forward earnings. That's the only bad thing going for it. They're going to grow at 50% a year. The guy is just unbelievable. I mean, um, I've talked about him in the past. A huge fan, always have been. I just can never get wrap my arms around the um, the valuation. And and that's a mistake. And, and sometimes I 
uh, I get disappointed about that. But actually, in talking with Tio today, he he made a good point, which was, uh, it's not part of your process. So, um, meaning sins of commission are problematic. Sins of omission are are not really bad. That that's a FOMO thing. In other words, um, taking a pass on something that does well if it's not within your discipline or process is actually a positive because nine times out of 10, they're going to be failures. So for instance, the last 10 years was the only time in history where you could buy a basket of stocks trading at 10 times sales and make money. Prior to the last 10 years where rates were going nothing but down and, and uh, money was free and you were forced out on the yield curve, which was an anomalous period in 200 years of financial, you know, the 500 years of financial markets, but, you know, 200 that we have real good data and developed world and yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> um, prior to that, if someone had said to you, you know, I'm looking for a way to lose all my money and destroy all my life. Could you give me the quickest path to doing that? And the quickest path would be, oh, it's very simple. Just buy a basket of stocks trading at 10 times sales and making no money. Within three years, you'll lose everything and, uh, you know, mission will be accomplished. And that's been consistent throughout history and should remain consistent throughout history uh, as rates normalize. But um, that hasn't been the case in the last 10 years. So if you had taken that view over 10 years, you might have been right and you might have caught a couple Teslas, although there weren't a couple of them, you know, maybe just a handful, but still 90% of them would have would have been failures. Um, and if it's outside your discipline, which um, our discipline is to buy high quality when it's on sale, durable, provable business franchises, not trying to guess what's next around the corner. Look, I'm excited about his robo taxis, no pedals, no steering wheels. Cost of uh, travel is going to be lower than a subway or bus ticket per mile. I'm excited about his humanoid robot. He says both of which are going to be worth more than the car business in the future. I, I actually believe he'll be right. It'll probably take three times longer than he says, but he'll he'll probably come, th come through with it, uh, as he said. Uh, but, you know, it's just what how much of that are you paying for? And the answer is stock probably still a multi-bagger. I'm just not paying up for these prices because if I, if I buy 10 high quality stocks at an 8 to 12 times multiple, I know over time I'm going to double and triple my money if, if they're high quality franchises and they're just down to two exogenous events or country or sector out of favor. If I buy 10 stocks trading at 10 or 20 times sales, uh, not making money, I mean, they could all go bankrupt. And uh, depending on where you are in the cycle, particularly in a rising rate environment cycle. So uh, it's just not my game. You know, I, I just hope this guy keeps winning because he's just doing great things. So and I'm not, you know, big green guy or anything. I just I just admire if you read that book, which I shared with you, I read on one of the plane rides recently, just read it. The guy just barrels through everything. Any obstacles he overcomes, like what he did with SpaceX. The whole book was actually about SpaceX, which I knew nothing about. And like to get that rocket launch in Hawaii, like the things they had to do and living out in tents. I mean, he's my kind of guy. He's, you know, I just, I just hope this guy, he'll be the first trillionaire, by the way, no question about it. Uh, that is for sure. The question is, what a, what will a trillion dollars buy by the time he becomes one? But nonetheless, uh, it'll be a lot of money. And uh, but more than that, he's he's caused a lot of great change. But those are you know once in a generation. He's the Thomas generation, Thomas Edison of of our generation. Last time that happened was a hundred years ago. So um, kudos. Um, okay, so you can read through all that if you like Tesla because it, there's a lot of good news there all around. Now, sentiment didn't come up much this week in the AAII sentiment. It was only up 18.9. Ryan Dietrich put out a great article every time it's been this low. Uh, the last time it was this uh, last week low was 30 years ago in 1992. The key point is when sentiment is this low, uh, what happens next? Three months, six months, and nine months. If you can't read the fine print, just go by the color. The answer is green things happen, good things happen on a three months, six months, and 12 month basis when retail becomes this pessimistic. So uh, we think that will be the case this time as well. Um, National Association of Active Investment Managers got their equity exposure down again. Uh, financials earnings over the last uh, 60 days, these top 30 weights of financials, earnings were revised up by 1.19%. Uh, and energy earnings were also revised up by 27%. A lot of that we believe at these levels is priced in. That's what we were anticipating. Now let's look at the China GDP numbers uh, for the first quarter, despite shutdowns, despite crackdowns, despite the 
a stimulus only starting in November and taking six months to hit, which should be now. Um, they still beat on GDP, 4.8 versus 4.4. No one's talking about that. 1.3 Q on Q, on Q versus 0.6 estimated. Fixed asset investment was up 9.3% year on year versus 8.5% estimated. No one's talking about that. Industrial production was still at 6.5%. Uh, last time it was at 75 uh, that's a big number considering all the headwinds. What got hit was retail sales because people, you know, were scared about their jobs and um, uh, were locked down. So that's understandable. Restaurants closed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then Chinese unemployment rate ticked up to 5.8% from 5.5%, which is a signal to the government, which is why they did the about face, because you get millions of people on the street without jobs, you're, you're toast. And the number one job of every politician, as I said on CNBC, is to get reelected, whether you're in China, Chandigarh, India, or Cheboygan, Michigan, uh, the, the goal is the same. And they're going to they're gonna do everything in their power to do so. Other economic data, building permits were up, believe, surprising to, despite the rates. Housing starts were up despite the rates. Uh, API had a draw. Um, crude inventories had a draw of 8 million barrels again. And existing home sales were down uh, modestly below expectations. Uh, what else? Initial jobless claims were higher than expected, but continuing claims, the most important number came down. That's positive. Uh, Philly manufacturing was a little light. And then what's the most important thing we've been talking about? $230. Well, we've been talking about it since fourth quarter of last year when it was at 218 or 220 and change. We said we think it's going to get to 230. It's at 228.49. I think this will get to 230 uh, for 2022. So that despite everyone's pessimism, earnings estimates continue to go up, not down against everyone's uh, prognostication of the end of the world. Um, but we're keeping our eye on all the metrics. If the facts change, we'll change our mind. Uh, but we do think we've got runway for stocks, even though we probably have a light recession mid to late next year. So with that said, hope you found this helpful. This was, oh, I, I got a few questions if you want to stick around. Uh, ben, first name only. Have you sold, hedged, or bought biotech in the past six weeks? I bought a ton today. Does biotech still, still make up approximately 20% of your portfolios? More than that. Um, any downsides to buying or holding biotech now? Yes, you could lose all your money. Um, next, uh, thanks for another hugely informative guide on the market twists and turns. Recent episodes have really helped contextualize the temporary noise of current global events. I have a decent position in BTAK in the UK. I want to ask your opinion whether at this point after a mini rally, you still think it's worth adding over the few weeks. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I've added, you know, you got to do gratefully for your opinion, not advice. Best regards, Drew. Um, yeah, look, I've covered Baba and Biotech. I've added to both. Um, JT Investor, hope you had a good week. Um, headline on Bloomberg, know the high level of ADR shares being converted to Hong Kong. Do you think the market technicals could be pressuring the stock price lower? How do brokers execute the mechanics of it? Look, you're missing the forest for the trees. Uh, bottom line is it's just under pressure and it's going to be that way until rates change. China opens up and just suck it up. You got to look a year to two years or, or get out. But you got to look a year to two years down the road uh, to make the big bucks like those brothers from New Zealand. JT Investors, any updated thoughts on Disney? I think it's a bargain here. Um, traded off hard on the streamers, but their, their parks are like, they're going to make so much money on their parks and their streaming. If you look at the HBO streaming, their content is better. I mean, Netflix content, like, I don't, I've never been a fan. I mean, I don't even think my kids watch it anymore. Maybe I should cancel my subscription. But, um, you know, every quarter they put out something like, um, what's that show that I like? Ozark. Okay, the second half of the last season's coming out next week. I'm excited for that. Uh, that race car Formula One thing is pretty good. So, you know, every quarter they put something out that everyone wants to watch. And for whatever it is, 20 bucks a month, it's not a big deal. So, um, uh, but uh, HBO and um, Disney's content is so much better. So I think I think you're going to see another blowout of streamers for Disney and their parks are going to do well. Uh, and they may have impacted Netflix because I think Netflix is... Uh, you know, Musk made a comment about Netflix uh, that I, I don't think is far from the truth. Uh, and I think it's probably hurt them in the short term. And if they start putting out good stuff that people want to watch, 
uh, they're going to bounce right back and never bet against Reed Hastings. It's going to be a home run. So leaving that aside, I want to thank you guys for listening in for an extended thing. Uh, I just, you know, it was such an awesome uh, talk I had with my friend. I just wanted to share that with you and hope it helps you as much as I did. So with that said, we're going to be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, thanks for listening. Make it a great one. Bye for now.